Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar today is entitled Hormone Testing, Selecting the Right Profile for Your Complex Patient. Our speaker is Dr. Stephen Goldman. My name is Christine Stubbe. I'm a medical education specialist in Genova's Asheville branch. I'm going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Stephen Goldman. Dr. Goldman earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Massachusetts. He received a Doctorate of Chiropractic from Cleveland Chiropractic College, where he also served as a member of the faculty. Following 25 years of family practice in Los Angeles, where he worked largely with athletes and patients concerned with optimal health, Dr. Goldman relocated to Asheville and joined the medical education team at Genova Diagnostics. As a medical education specialist, Dr. Goldman provides educational support to physicians and also authors medical education support materials. The presentation and slide deck will be available on our website within a few days of the webinar. You can access these resources along with previous webinar recordings, brief video modules, and other materials by clicking the Clinicians tab on the homepage. Now I'm gonna turn the role of presenter over to Dr. Goldman. Okay, we made the handoff and connection. The hardest part is behind us now. Hi, I'm Steve Goldman at Genova Diagnostics and thank you, Christine, for that introduction. And today we're going to speak about uh, selecting the right profile for your complex patient. So this is all about hormone testing. So here are our objectives. Following this presentation, participants will be able to distinguish the pros and cons of serum, uh, salivary testing, urinary hormone testing options. They'll be able to recognize which tests may best serve the specific needs of the patient. They'll be able to utilize testing in the context of case studies. So I have a couple of case studies ready, um, and I think we'll find them of interest. But before we start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what a challenge this webinar has been. And, and I say that because there's so much out there in regard to hormone testing, and a lot of certainty sometimes, uh, a lot of discussion, and a lot of debate amongst people who really are very knowledgeable. And I, I suspect that's one of the reasons so many of you are here today uh, uh, getting another perspective. And it takes me back to a, a quotation that I often see in presentations uh, by Mark Twain, which is, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And uh, in looking at the evidence and looking at the discussion of hormone testing and what's best in, in different situations, there is certainly reasonable room for debate and a lot to look into. And I think ironically, the fact is that Mark Twain never said that. Uh, actually, it was a quotation by Josh Billings, maybe. Uh, because there's a list of three or four other names of people that are also credited with this quote, but it wasn't Mark Twain. So let's bear that perspective in mind as we uh, move ahead and look at hormone testing and our options in a clinical setting. So what are the symptoms of hormone imbalance? I have a list here, weight gain, anxiety, low libido, brain fog, vaginal dryness, hair loss, hot flashes, sleep disturbances, mood swings, breast tenderness, it goes on. In fact, we could probably go on for several slides here and, and still not run out of various symptoms of hormonal imbalance. And I think what that speaks to is how frustrating in a clinical setting it is to say, oh, there's hair loss, therefore thyroid. Oh, there's hot flashes, therefore estrogen needs to be addressed. But we're looking at a balancing act. We're looking at so many different uh, hormones that work together that sometimes the lists can be a little bit overwhelming uh, in terms of trying to find what is that one thing. And bear in mind, oftentimes it's not that one thing, that there are many things to look at. So it's an underlying truth. Hormones are about finding a balance. One always affects the other. You can't really do this work in isolation. The list of symptoms, as I said, goes on and on. And testing provides greater insight. By getting the data, we can make more uh, educated uh, uh, protocols, design protocols for that specific patient, but we have to look at the big picture. And so the key is in reaching a state of balance for each individual patient. 
So start slow and then increase in small increments. It's always a good idea to start with the lowest dose that you think really uh, is, is available and then work your way up. Much more difficult to do it the other way around. And always monitor the clinical picture. And that's where lab testing is so valuable as a tool in your toolbox. You want to know what are these levels. And even when a patient is doing well, uh, you might want to test just to get a sense of what are the levels when this patient is really feeling their optimal, their best uh, self. So how do we determine which specimen type to utilize? The clinical question being asked is really what you want to know. What do you need to learn? What data would be valuable to you based on the patient sitting in front of you? Is it a risk assessment? Is it, I need to know what their hormone levels are so that I can provide more or less uh, uh, hormone therapy? There are a lot of different questions that can be raised um, and you really need to be specific. What's the data I'm looking for? Understand the advantages and disadvantages of each specimen option. And we'll go through these. And again, there's a lot of discussion out there in the field amongst many people uh, who study this all the time in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of the various specimen types. And what therapeutic modalities are being used? How do you intend to treat the patient? So what are the clinical considerations and sample types? We're gonna look at blood, we're gonna look at saliva, and we're gonna look at urine and just get a feeling for when I lean to one over another. So the sample types. Serum. Serum reflects circulating hormones. So that would include bound and unbound active uh, hormone levels. Saliva reflects unbound free active hormone. And then urine. Urine reflects the combination of both excess endocrine production and peripheral production of hormones and metabolites. We're excreting. So what we're excreting in terms of the parent hormone and the metabolites. All three are very different. And so uh, it's very important to be uh, comfortable with when one would be better than the other in terms of the specific need. What are you looking for data-wise, as I said before? And here's a, a metaphor. Metaphorically speaking, a guy walks into a bank. Blood is like asking to see all of his holdings, his IRAs, his stocks, his bonds, his cash, the bound and unbound levels. Saliva is like asking how much cash he's got in his account. What's unbound? What's available now? Urine is like asking for all of his receipts, the metabolites. So he can add them up and figure out where he's been spending his money. And that's why with urine, always think about the metabolites because they allow for greater understanding of estrogen detoxification. So when detoxification, when risk uh, is my primary concern, I'm going to want to get a look at those urine uh, metabolites. Serum testing. Now, for serum testing, we're looking at circulating hormones. That's both bound and unbound active levels. It's the most studied matrix for hormone assessment. It's probably been used the longest. I know when I first started at Genova uh, 11 years ago, um, this uh, was used quite a lot. Uh, and it was a, a lot of attention on serum testing out there in the field. Uh, transdermal and transvaginal levels may be underrepresented, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. It does measure the sex hormone binding globulin protein. Sex uh, hormone binding globulin, SHBG, is important. It binds to both estrogen and testosterone, although primarily uh, it likes to go to testosterone, so it can have an impact by freeing up more uh, estrogen and less testosterone. Serum testing and hormone replacement therapy monitored, and we'll talk about that as well. It's generally an acceptable matrix for patients that are not on hormone replacement therapy. So I find in, in, in speaking to doctors on the phone quite often uh, that serum testing is a good way to check what those parent hormone levels are before they begin their hormone therapy but it may be used in patients who are on oral hormone replacement therapy, pellet therapy. Again, there are gray areas here. I know uh, with pellets, many people utilize 
uh, a blood in order to get a level in different time increments. So here's a study that indicated that the reliance on serum levels of progesterone for monitoring topical dose could lead to an underestimation of tissue levels. In other words, uh, the idea that uh, the lipophilic progesterone may be underreported uh, uh, in tissue uh, through serum levels. So you might get low levels of progesterone when you're looking at serum. So if that's the case, when is serum testing most useful? Well, uh, for circulating hormones bound and unbound fractions of the hormones, for a single sample. So when you're doing serum, you're doing a blood draw, you're getting a moment in time. Uh, when you're looking at, um, uh, for example, saliva, we'll see that you can look at increments of time and look at patterns. There's a greater breadth of literature with serum, and perhaps because people were utilizing it earlier, but there is a lot out there uh, in PubMed if you're looking for peer-reviewed literature on serum testing. Uh, some hormones are assessed through blood only. So if you want to look at sex hormone binding globulin specifically, um, you need to do that in a blood test. If you want to look at thyroid hormones, there are other options, but really uh, your gold standard will be thyroid hormone testing through blood. And then there are estrogen metabolites. We have a test and we'll look at that in a moment, the hormonal health. It does include the 2-hydroxyestrone phase one metabolite of estrogen. It has a 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone as well. But I would reiterate that if you're really looking for metabolites, blood is not your best option that's when you start thinking about urine testing. Now, uh, it can be used to establish a baseline level before beginning hormone therapy. So many doctors will look at uh, uh, blood levels, serum levels, and get a number. And you can return and compare uh, from test to test and see increments of change. Uh, and those changes would likely be accurate from one test to another. Although again, uh, most people utilize it for a baseline pre-hormone replacement therapy. Uh, there are precautions. Transdermal hormone replacement therapy, as I said, is underrepresented in blood. So you tend to see lower levels. So here's a hormonal health uh, test, and you can see there's your progesterone, and there are your estrogens. So you can get a feeling for progesterone relative to the estrogens, um, and uh, be aware, again, that you may see with transdermals a lower progesterone finding. Uh, underrepresentation. There's your sex hormone binding globulin level, uh, and that's utilized for androgens. The testosterone in blood tends to be, uh, for women especially, uh, bound and unbound. And so the free androgen index is a calculation utilizing sex hormone binding globulin with testosterone to get a sense of what's available. And you see that free androgen index, and then the 2 and 16 hydroxyestrone metabolites and the ratio. Urine testing. In urine, you have options of first morning void collection or 24 hour collection. Uh, and it provides comprehensive evaluation of hormone metabolism, the metabolites, the receipts. So the 24 hour tends to be preferred for patients on any hormone replacement therapy. By collecting over 24 hours, you're really casting a wider net. The ups and downs that come with supplementation are more mediated by the, the wider range of collection time, the 24 hour, whereas first morning void may be used for patients not on hormone replacement therapy. These are unbound hormones and circulating metabolites. Remember, they're being excreted. You get the parent hormone, but you also get the metabolites of that parent hormone. So we're assessing hormone metabolism. It assesses steroidal enzyme activity as well. So we're adding up receipts through metabolites and getting data regarding risk assessment so that if we're concerned about which pathways may be upregulated, pathways towards more risk, we wanna know that as part of our protocol when we're gonna give hormone replacement therapy. Can you use urine testing to monitor hormone replacement therapy? This, I can tell you, is a hotly debated topic. Uh, urine is seen as a reflection of blood because it's a filtrate of blood. You have blood levels and then there's excretion into the urine. So many clinicians assert that urine testing can be used to monitor orally administered uh, hormones. What about topical hormone replacement therapy? 
Well, many clinicians indicate that one cannot use urine testing to monitor hormone replacement therapy for the parent hormone. Research has shown that topical progesterone is underrepresented in the blood, as I said earlier. Therefore, it might well also be underrepresented in the urine, which again is a filtrate of the blood. Some clinicians have asserted that topical estrogen does show up in the urine, but this hasn't been fully validated or validated in the literature. Uh, there are studies out there, but in terms of peer-reviewed literature, uh, there's work to do. Genova offers serum, saliva, and urine testing to accommodate varying opinions regarding best practices. So we'll always offer you these options based on what you feel is best as far as the protocol uh, for your specific patient. So consideration for urine. Urine hormone levels represent excreted levels. That's what you're excreting. What's, uh, uh, therefore, if the urine levels are robust, there's a concern around tissue saturation. So when I look at a urine test, like a complete hormones, and see very high levels of the parent uh, uh, hormone, I'm concerned that there, that may represent a lot of hormone saturation, that it would be excreted in such high concentrations. But if the levels are moderate or low, then the interpretation is a little bit more difficult because lower levels, less excretion in urine may mean lower circulating levels, but it might also mean better tissue utilization of the hormone. So less is being excreted. So when I see high levels in urine, I feel pretty confident that I'm looking at high levels. When I see moderate to low levels, it's a little trickier in terms of how to interpret those levels. Am I looking at uh, just moderate or low levels or better utilization? less to excrete. The levels of metabolites provide insight into detoxification pathways and risk assessment. Again, I always think first urine and the metabolites and risk assessment. So this is a complete hormone. It's a 24 hour. And you can see this is the steroidogenic pathway at a glance chart. And we'll look at this uh, uh, as we go through this uh, panel. Uh, but this is really where I discuss with the doctors that I speak to and with patients in terms of understanding the steroidogenic pathway and the metabolites and what they mean. Uh, we also break down the information. We have an anabolic catabolic balance that provides insight also into adrenal function, which is very much a part of the HPA axis and the levels of estrogens and sex hormones that we see. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But you always want to also think about the adrenals when you're thinking about hormones and that HPA axis. Here are some uh, metabolites laid out uh, and further reference ranges for the estrogen and estrogen metabolites. So this is the complete hormones test. This is the steroidogenic pathway. It begins on the left. You see pregnenolone and uh, progesterone. Now, progesterone metabolizes so quickly uh, that in the urine, when it's excreted, it's really mostly in that form of pregnane diol. So here's a case whereby for progesterone, we're looking at a metabolite, uh, an immediate metabolite to get a sense of the presence of progesterone, the level of progesterone. And here, you can see the estrogen metabolites. We're gonna fo focus on this in just a moment, but you can see we have the parent estradiol, estrone, and estriol here. In this case, they look a little bit low. It's not unusual in this situation to uh, assess a lower estrogen level, but as I said earlier, they may also be utilizing the estrogens uh, uh, very well. Um, but we can at least get a look at these estrogens and progesterone and compare them somewhat, but those metabolites are super important. And in between that, to get a balance between the progesterone and estrogen and metabolites is this wide-ranging glucocorticoid and, and androgen uh, a portion, the anabolic-catabolic balance. So we're going to look at, as progesterone and pregnenolone move downstream towards the estrogens, how are they doing in terms of the production of cortisol and the glucocorticoids and the androgens, the DHEA and the testosterone? Because to balance a steroidogenic pathway, that red catabolic and green anabolic section need to have balance as well. So the HPA axis and imbalance. Uh, stress alters the HPA axis balance. So it decreases the production of androgens and estrogens. So the red line is that stressor. That could be uh, toxicity, toxic exposure, infection, inflammation, physical stress, mental stress, any of those stressors that will pull pregnenolone and progesterone towards the production of cortisol and the glucocorticoids, the red area, possibly to the detriment of the androgens, the DHEA and the androgens testosterone further downstream. And without those androgens, there's less conversion into the estrogens. 
And so the impact of stressors to cortisol can impact both androgen levels and estrogen levels downstream. Now, increased cortisol production has its issues, right? It may impact thyroid and insulin levels. High cortisol can implement less thyroid production. There's a competition there. And so your hypothyroid patients may actually be high cortisol patients, and that may be the problem that needs to be addressed. Um, high insulin levels also with cortisol are problematic as well. So stress alters the HPA axis, and it also can lead to an increase in the mineral corticoids. And when you have a stimulation of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, that leads to tachycardia and elevated blood pressure. So again, it's all about balance. So here's that anabolic catabolic balance where we took the catabolic 17 hydroxy steroid total. That was everything in uh, the area of uh, cortisol, that red area, um, uh, the cortisol metabolites, uh, not including the cortisol. And then we had the anabolic, the DHEA plus its metabolites. And when we look at this, we see it's, it's not too bad. It's not leaning one way more than the other. We don't wanna see it leaning towards the catabolic, which is more about wear and tear. We rather see it lean more towards the anabolic 17 keto steroids, the DHEA and its metabolites, because that's about repair. And so when we look at the overall balance at 0 0.3, it's not bad, it's in the green, um, but uh, certainly balance is what we're looking for in the middle portion of the steroidogenic uh, pathway. So we can get more information around this by looking at an adrenal cortex stress profile, for example. Now, as we move downstream into the estrogen and estrogen metabolites, here you see the estro and estradiol and estriol and the various phase one and phase two metabolites. Here's where we can assess risk using urine testing. So for those patients that come to your office and say there's a family history of breast cancer, I'm concerned about risk, I might wanna increase my estrogens, but I'm concerned about risk factors, this is the section of the test that's really gonna be a great tool. It's also, as part of the uh, com uh, complete hormones, uh, a test of its own called essential estrogens, just this portion. So you see here that you will look at the uh, estrone, estradiol, and estriol, the, the, the parent uh, hormones, the parent estrogens. Um, and you're also gonna get a look at the phase one metabolites. So as estrone and estradiol move downstream, you can see here whereby the estrone will move to the 2-hydroxy uh, estrone estradiol. Here it's rather low, and you can see the enzyme, the cytochrome P451A1. Now the significance here uh, is that the 2-hydroxy is considered a risk-reducing metabolite. So we want to see an upregulated 1A1. This is why you give patients things like DIM and I3C, to upregulate that enzyme to increase that 2-hydroxy risk-reducing metabolite. But we also have the 16-alpha hydroxyestrone metabolite. That's a moderate risk inducer because it's very estrogenic at cell receptor sites. And then the 4-hydroxy, and we'll go through this again in the next slide, the 4-hydroxy is really uh, likely the most risk-inducing, potentially risk-inducing metabolite, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But these three represent the phase one metabolites of the estrogen. So the phase one estrogen metabolites, the 2-hydroxy, little estrogen receptor binding, so it blocks the action of potentially carcinogenic estrogen. So it's seen as a safe metabolite, but must be methylated. In other words, 2-hydroxy phase one is a good guy, as long as it goes through phase two methylation, where it becomes water soluble and is excreted, and that's about methylation. 16 alpha hydroxy, as I said, has estrogenic activity uh, and increases the risk of breast cancer as a result. And then the 4 hydroxy uh, can be oxidized. Now, the 4 hydroxy is problematic because if it doesn't get methylated or phase 2 detoxified through another pathway of detoxification, 4 hydroxy can be oxidized. And it's oxidized into something called the 3 4 quinone metabolite, uh, not measured here. But the 3,4-quinone metabolite creates DNA adducts, damage to DNA, which increases the risk of breast cancer. Now, in that situation, you want to minimize oxidative stress to minimize the oxidation of that phase 1,4-hydroxy so that it's not 
oxidized into the quinone. So anything you can do to limit oxidative stress. Also, glutathione S-transferase is an uh, enzyme that can reduce the damage to the DNA. It won't lower the amount of the 3,4-quinone, but it can lower the DNA damage. So again, here's the 2-hydroxy. We want it to go through phase two, methylation via COMT, methyl transferase. Takes its methyl group, conjugates it, slaps it onto 2-hydroxy to make 2-methoxy. And that's what we want. The more 2-methoxy, the better. And so when we judge COMT activity, we're gonna look at the 2-hydroxy, 2-methoxy ratio. The higher the 2-methoxy is in that ratio, the lower the number. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But if 2-hydroxy is methylated, it's water-soluble now with that methyl group and readily excreted. That's what we want. We keep an eye on the 16-alpha-hydroxy, which by the way, can become estriol. And there's that 4-hydroxy. And if it's not being methylated well, then our concern is if it's not being detoxified, it may well be oxidized. And if that high 8.3, that's a red flag to me. It tells me that we're making a lot of 4-hydroxy. And we want to do whatever we can to get the estrone and estradiol more to the 2-hydroxy. DIM, I3C, cruciferous vegetables, anti-inflammatory support. Um, because that 4-hydroxy being elevated is a risk factor. It could be oxidized into a quinone, and that creates DNA damage. And by the way, breast cancer risk and prostate risk in men. So here are our key points. The complete hormones profile is a useful diagnostic tool for assessing risk for estrogen metabolism and providing useful data in designing a protocol for nutritional intervention. There are specific things you can do to try to upregulate these pathways in the direction that is safer. It provides specific data regarding methylation activity. It helps to examine the role of stress on hormone metabolism. Our anabolic catabolic balance can speak to a catabolic balance whereby stressors are pushing the progesterone into cortisol to the detriment of androgens and estrogens. It helps us to focus on the estrogen phase one and phase two metabolites, key findings for risk assessment. It's available as a first morning void or 24 hour collection profile. If the patient is on hormone replacement therapy, I would recommend that 24 hour collection profile. So what about salivary testing? Well, when is it most useful or more useful? Well, remember, saliva tells us about unbound bioavailable fraction of the hormone. So we're not looking at anything bound and unavailable. It's the cash, remember our metaphor. So a single or sequential sample collected over the day or month can be utilized. Now, that's really a great advantage. Remember we talked about blood, one blood draw, one moment in time. With urine, we can mediate with a 24 hour collection. But with saliva, we can look at a cycle. A rhythm test can show us a 28-day cycle. We can look at things like melatonin and cortisol and see the track their circadian rhythm. So that's really what saliva brings to the table that, that nothing else brings. It can be used to establish baseline levels before beginning hormone replacement therapy. So you can get a real sense of unbound levels of the hormone. Uh, and people utilize it a lot to monitor hormone replacement therapy as well. So there are some special considerations or precautions. If your patient has bleeding gums, gingivitis, that blood that can come into the uh, saliva testing can produce, ele can produce elevated levels of hormones. So you don't ever want to do uh, salivary testing uh, when there's gingivitis or bleeding gums. It should not be used in conjunction with sublingual hormone treatments. And if you think about it, if you're using a, a, a trochee under the tongue, a sublingual hormone, it's so close to the salivary glands that it can really give you outlier numbers. Transdor excuse me, transdermal hormone replacement therapy can sometimes produce abnormally high levels. And we see this. And those of you that I know call in, we speak on the phone and review tests, every now and then you might see that kind of elevation. And it may be a factor of timing or the site of application or contamination. So when I talk about timing, consider collecting a sample 12 hours after the last hormone application. When you use a transdermal, uh, typically there's a big jump over the first four hours 
And there's a normalization after about 12 hours to baseline levels. And that's why the timing of collection can really influence the finding. Um, and so that's really important. And if you apply a transdermal closer to the salivary glands, to the neck, for example, as opposed to lower down, that uh, location can also uh, be a big influence in terms of the findings. Now, I mentioned earlier tracking a cycle over uh, 28 days. Uh, and uh, I did do a webinar just on the rhythm test. So if you go to our website, uh, please feel free to look that up uh, where I do a, a lot of discussion over the rhythm test. But the rhythm test is a great way to use saliva to get a sense of a premenopausal woman's uh, cycle and estrogen progesterone levels. Uh, because you're looking over time. Remember, there are these circadian rhythms. You expect elevations and drops. That's part of the cycle. So with the rhythm test, you do 11 salivary samples over a 28-day period. And that's going to measure estradiol and progesterone uh, 11 different times. So bleeding begins three days in, first sample for estradiol and progesterone. And then there's one testosterone as well. And you can really track a cycle this way. Now, the Rhythm Plus has all of that, but adds the adrenal cortex stress profile. And you can do that with a CAR, cortisol awakening response. Um, and you could also um, add the melatonin, uh, three samples as part of that. Now, I bring this up because remember we talked about the steroidogenic pathway chart and how cortisol and the adrenals are such a big part of balance of estrogens and uh, androgens. And so if you really want to get to the bottom of things, I think that HPA axis is a big part of it. That's data that I think is of great value. So you can do the rhythm test just to track the cycle, or you can do the rhythm plus to track the cycle, but also get a feel for that HPA axis and what may be going on. So this is what the rhythm test looks like. The top is in green, the estradiol. You see that peak at uh, about day 12, which would be a follicular spike. And then you see also the blue, which is the progesterone. About a week later, you see the, the progesterone has its luteal phase spike. So that's a cycle. Although you may notice that the estradiol is a little low uh, in the uh, luteal phase. Uh, this is the rhythm plus. This also includes uh, the comprehensive melatonin profile, uh, as well as you see that four point cortisol to the right, uh, as well as CAR, CAR, cortisol awakening response, uh, which uh, speaks to resilience. Um, and it's just another way of tracking. You open your eyes in the night and as soon as light gets in there, you have this response uh, that should create a surge over 30 minutes, and then you measure that 30 minutes. That's CAR. That's a resilience uh, through a different pathway, through what's called the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN. And then, of course, you also have the option of just doing the four-point uh, 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 ASP, adrenal cortex stress profile, with DHEA. Now, you know, when we're tracking the cycle, remember, a cycle is typically 28 days. And then in the middle, at 14 days, uh, should be uh, ovulation. That's in a classic 28-day cycle. The follicular phase to the left, that's the estrogen-dominated with its follicular spike. Um, uh, so there's a buildup of estradiol followed by a spike likely caused by ovulation. We can't be certain, but you can see there's the estrogen, there's that spike, there's ovulation. The luteal phase, the second half here, uh, is 14 days. And it's generally pretty strictly 14 days. If there's a difference in the length of the cycle, it's generally going to be about that first half. The estrogen follicular phase tends to be the one that will fluctuate. So 14 days luteal phase includes luteal progesterone spike seven days following the follicular spike. That's what a, a normal cycle looks like. Changes in the length are, again, typically for the follicular phase. So if we're looking at the uh, rhythm test, we have, there's the estrogen, you see that, that spike that happens, and here's what it looks like on the test. And there's your progesterone in it, the luteal phase spike, and here's what it looks like on the test as well, in blue. The, the, the width of the color, if we're looking at the estradiol, for example, the width is uh, um, the reference range, uh, and uh, this is one standard deviation, which you kind of like to be. And you have uh, that spike, and you see it represented right about there between days 10 and 14 um, uh, in the 
in, in the salivary testing, and you have the spike of progesterone there at about days you know, 19 to 21. This is why when people uh, do testing and they want to really get a feeling for progesterone, for example, in a blood test, they'll do testing between days 19 and 21 to try to catch that, that luteal phase progesterone spike. So here's the menopause plus. And you can see there's the uh, uh, front page, and then we have the various salivary hormone results where we take averages. That's the advantage of the menopause plus is that you look at three different findings for, for the estrone, uh, estradiol, estriol, and we'll look at that. It has the comprehensive melatonin profile, and of course the adrenal cortex stress profile and the option of CAR. Again, you're looking at hormones, but in the context of also the HPA axis, the adrenals. Remember, the whole notion of you, you have a, a young woman and, and the cycles of the rhythm test, but then as there's a shift into perimenopause, a lot of that shift is the shift of ovarian production of sex hormones into uh, adrenal uh, production. And that's why looking at the adrenals is so important to get a sense of how that function is, is doing, to monitor that. Now, you also have the option of a one-day hormone check, where instead of an average over three days for estradiol, estrone, estriol, uh, as well as uh, progesterone, um, you, you just have that one day, whereas in the menopause plus, the advantage is that you have it over three different days. So you're measuring the estrone three different days and an average, three different days and an average. So that gives you a, a wider net because there can be fluctuations. There are those who say if you have a menopausal patient, you can do the one-day hormone check because there's not likely to be a lot of fluctuation. I tend to lean more toward, if you can, getting the three days and an average is still worthwhile. Casting a wider net, for me, is data that I find valuable. So the menopause plus uh, for perimenopausal women will, uh, who experience greater fluctuations in their hormone levels, you might want to look at that uh, uh, because it gives you a wider net. Um, and testing over several days is advantageous, uh, as I said, uh, but the one-day hormone test is really a, a similar test. It's just done in one day. So if you feel you have a menopausal patient, you're not expecting fluctuations, the one-day hormone test may be just fine. Menopausal women may find this a good fit. Now, for premenopausal women who do not wish to collect over 28 days, they may also find the menopause plus a better fit in that at least they're getting an average over several days. But still, I would emphasize that if you have a premenopausal woman and you want to really get a feeling for their progesterone, estradiol, testosterone, that the rhythm test is really going to give you better information. Uh, both tests allow for the HPA axis with melatonin and adrenal cortex stress profile. So our key points. Hormone testing options include blood, saliva, and urine. Knowing the specific information you need is essential in choosing the right profile. Each testing option has its strengths and weaknesses. Salivary testing uh, allows for a timeline. So blood is a moment in time. Urine reflects a limited time frame, up to 24 hours, but saliva gives you a look at circadian rhythms. Saliva, uh, salivary testing for a cycle is most often collected during the luteal spike of a cycle. So whenever you're trying to get a better look at progesterone, think about uh, that luteal phase spike days 19 to 21. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of case studies with all that we just went through. So case study number one, a perimenopausal female. She's 44 years old. Her chief complaints, mild depression, sleep disturbances, and low libido. Her cycle is irregular, but it's often shortened. Remember, irregular is, is, is a component of perimenopause. Shortened is likely in that follicular phase. Her family history, breast cancer, mother, so risk factors to take into account. Patient expresses concern regarding risk. Her occupation, she's a middle school teacher. I was a middle school teacher for a week. That is stressful. Medications, oral progesterone to aid sleep. Lifestyle aerobics class twice a week and a standard American diet. So um, she's taking progesterone. Um, she's exercising, but not as much as we'd probably like to see. And she's probably going to need some uh, uh, dietary input here. So 
complete hormones 24 hours. Why 24 hours? Well, she's taking uh, hormone therapy in, in the form of progesterone, so I'd rather have that wider net. She has robust progesterone in form of pregnant dial. And when I say robust, I don't mean very elevated, but she's well within the reference range on the higher end. Her estrogens are kind of moderate. Now remember, you do wanna have more progesterone on board than estrogen in general. Uh, physiologically, estrogen is, is, is the bigger risk. Um, so progesterone helps to mediate that risk. This is why when you supplement, you can supplement with progesterone alone, but you don't supplement with estrogen alone. You would always want to add progesterone when providing estrogen. The anabolic catabolic leans to catabolic. So she's got a lot of that progesterone on board based on the pregnant dial, and that might be a reflection of her supplementation, uh, but she's more catabolic. So more of it is heading towards the cortisol than towards the DHEA and its metabolites. So we want to evaluate the estrogen metabolites to get a feeling for risk and evaluate her capacity to detoxify. So if we look at this uh, close up, we see there's that pregnant dial. Again, she's supplementing. Uh, and here are the estrogens. So the estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Well, estriol actually is, is pretty robust, but she's got a pretty good moderate overall picture here as far as her estrogen. You see that? Now, what about her risk factors? Well, is she methylating okay? If we look at that 2-hydroxy, the risk reducer at 13.1, I like that that's nice and robust. The 2-methoxy uh, at 2.1, if we look at the methylation activity here at 6.2, is rather moderate. It's not bad, but it could certainly be improved. The more to the left, the more methylation is happening, the more 2-methoxy is being made. So I would probably want to help her with methylation with the various vitamin and mineral cofactors that come along with that supplementation. What about her 4-hydroxy? Well, you know, her 4-hydroxy at 3.1 isn't bad. Her 4-methoxy is rather low. Um, I think personally in this situation, I would want to make sure she is catabolic, that there might be oxidative stress. I'd want to make sure that I could limit that oxidative stress to limit the uh, oxidation of 4-hydroxy potentially into quinone. So, Methylation support makes sense here as well. Antioxidant support also makes good sense, including glutathione nutrient cofactors. Remember, glutathione as transferase minimizes, uh, reduces the damage to DNA from oxidized 4-hydroxy from the quinones. So methylation is a need um, and antioxidant support, perhaps with some glutathione cofactor support. So, what about her um, HPA axis? Well, we mentioned a catabolic balance. So she's taking a lot of that progesterone, which she's already supplementing, and a good amount of it is going towards cortisol. And so I'm gonna go back just to look at that. And you can see the DHEA is kind of on the low side. Uh, here's, here's something I think that's important. DHEA at face value may not tell me the tale because the DHEA may be very metabolized. But fortunately, when I go to this anabolic catabolic balance, that's 17 ketosteroid total, remember, is the DHEA plus its downstream metabolites. So I would say that that 15.7 is probably a better indication of the DHEA than the face value, which was very, very low. Now, when we look at the catabolic 17 hydroxy steroids, however, we see that 14.2 uh, is um, rather high. And so a lot of that uh, progesterone is moving to the catabolic side. There's a need here, and you see it with that 0.1 balance, a need here to help with her adrenal function. It's not that her anabolic is super low at 15.7, but a lot of that progesterone seems to be headed towards the catabolic side of the ledger. So what do we do for this patient? I would say first, hormone support. Consider lowering the progesterone uh, if, if there's imbalance, um, uh, and that's certainly a possibility. Uh, as far as the HPA axis, I would monitor the cortisol and DHEA with an adrenal cortex stress profile. Uh, there are uh, adaptogens like relora, rhodiola, that can be utilized to help uh, with that uh, uh, high cortisol uh, production, that pull towards cortisol. And consider heart math. Heart math is often utilized uh, for, uh, for cardiac support, 
But heart math is a great way to get people to relax, to have a mechanism by which they can actually measure where they're at. It's, I, I think it's so frustrating as both a, a patient and a doctor to say to a patient, you're stressed out, lower your stress, you know, do something about that. Uh, if you can give them something really specific like heart math, that can be very useful. Uh, and they need to be able to sleep. So you think about magnesium at night, phosphatidyl serine three hours before bed. Um, uh, you think about uh, the uh, 4-hydroxyestrogen risk that we talked about address oxidative stress to prevent the 3,4 quinone production, increase the 2-hydroxy phase one metabolite with DIM, I3C, and antioxidants. And remember the glutathione cofactors, N-acetylcysteine, glycine, glutamine, magnesium, B6. Uh, liposomal glutathione is often utilized. That's fine too. And as far as her diet, consider a Mediterranean style diet, something that is it, a better rounded diet in terms of nutrients and a more consistent exercise program as well. Let's look at another case study. This is a menopausal uh, woman. She's 62 years old. Her chief complaints are fatigue, uh, difficult sleep, foggy thinking, memory lapses, low libido, gut issues, including bloating and intermittent constipation. Her occupation, she's in public relations. She's an executive with a high stress demand job. Now, uh, her medical history, she has a low thyroid function, but she's not taking thyroid meds. Her medications, she's taking some B-complex intermittent probiotics and prebiotics, likely a response to some of those gut issues. And her lifestyle, she's got a diet rich in vegetables, including fish and poultry but very little consistent exercise, occasional weekend hikes with friends. So here's the menopause plus. Remember the option was a one day, which would have been taken in one day, or the menopause plus, which looks at a three day average. So when we look at her estradiol, you can see 2.6, 2.7, 2.7, that average of 2.7 for a menopausal female is a little bit on the low side. What about her estrone? Well, her estrone at 92.4, 80.5, 137 averages out to 103. And within the reference range, that's pretty good. That's certainly well past the mid range. So her estrogen seems to be really more applicable as far as estrone. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. Remember, estradiol tends to be the estrogen of preference in uh, a premenopause. But in menopause, the estrogen of choice tends to be estrone. Uh, when we look at that, uh, uh, that chart, the steroidogenic pathway uh, chart that we talked about in the urine testing, you might have noticed estradiol and estrone have arrows pointing back and forth. They can go back and forth. But in menopause, estradiol tends to lean more to the production of estrone. The problem with that is estrone uh, is really risk-inducing in that uh, it's, it, it's very uh, conducive to the cell receptor sites. Uh, uh, the alpha receptor sites in breast tissue. So higher estrone does increase risk and therefore makes me immediately think, hey, I'd like to look at her urine metabolites to get a sense of how she's metabolizing that estrone. We can see also the progesterone averages out to 112, uh, which is a little bit on the low side. So kind of a moderate estrone presence, but a little bit of a lower progesterone. Again, you like to see the progesterone outweigh estrone in terms of risk. Um, and then the testosterone was rather low as well. Um, and you see that here at less than 30. Now be aware that that average estriol at non-reportable is because we have three findings that were less than 70. Uh, the computer won't take a range less than 70 and put it into a, uh, an average. So less than 70, we know she's low, but it's non-reportable because we have ranges here, not a number. If it, they were all 70, this would say 70. Having a low estriol is not surprising. In premenopause, you tend to see estriol higher in pregnancy. In menopause, typically supplementation like biased um, or vaginal cle uh, uh, cream locally often utilized. Here's our uh, um, uh, adrenal cortex stress profile. And what do we see? Well, we see here that she's got really high uh, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Uh, uh, cortisol. She's kind of high throughout the day. Her waking level isn't that high, but it's you know, higher within the reference range. Remember, she's having trouble sleeping. When you see this, 
you generally have a patient that's having trouble sleeping. And remember the steroidogenic pathway, if the pregnenolone and progesterone are moving towards cortisol production, we're likely not gonna see as much DHEA on board. And here we see kind of a low DHEA overall. So here you think maybe about lower uh, levels of DHEA supplementation while working uh, with adaptogens, for example, to try to bring this down. And here's the uh, salivary melatonin. Melatonin I find very interesting um, because in this case, remember typically a high cortisol, you'll tend to see low melatonin. Um, uh, high melatonin, lower cortisol, but um, melatonin really does adapt. In this case, we have relatively high levels here of cortisol, but you can also see that the, um, uh, uh, the levels of melatonin are low at this point. So what do we do for this patient? Check thyroid levels, comprehensive thyroid assessment. Remember, uh, low progesterone is associated with low thyroid. High cortisol tends to lead to lower thyroid. So it may not just be about giving thyroid. That's that balance that we talked about. She needs to sleep. A high evening cortisol, so support that, adaptogens, DHEA, uh, um, magnesium, phosphatidylserine. Uh, consider hormone therapy for the lower progesterone. Consider testosterone, but monitor it carefully. Remember, it can aromatize into estrogen, and that's why you want to monitor. Um, and always, I would say, in this case, you really want to monitor metabolites through urine to address stress. And of course, she has gut issues, GI effects, comprehensive profile, stool. That's gonna be your gold standard. Key points, hormones are about balance. Urine testing provides insight into metabolites and risk. Premenopausal women should consider the rhythm plus. Perimenopausal testing will reflect fluctuating levels. You can still do the rhythm plus or menopause plus to monitor changes. Menopausal women should consider the one day hormone check if they're not seeing much fluctuation or the menopause plus to cast a wider neck. A wider neck? a wider net, forgive me. The objectives were to distinguish the pros and cons of the different types, recognize the best test, and utilize testing in the context of case studies. And so now, any questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. That was a great presentation, lots of information. We did receive quite a few clinical questions, so let's start with this one. Um, so what, what salivary test would you recommend? Because we were talking about the rhythm test for patients who are cycling. And so what about patients who are of age to be cycling, but maybe they have amenorrhea or they have irregular periods? Um, what test would you recommend? And is the rhythm test appropriate even for a menopausal patient? Well, you know, typically the, the advantage of the rhythm is to get a view of a cycle, um, even if it's a very irregular cycle. Uh, so uh, I think it would be difficult for a menopausal woman. I don't know that the uh, rhythm test would be appropriate. I think the menopause plus, because you still cast a wide enough uh, 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 net um, to, to get a sense of the various sex hormones and where this patient is over a, a, a long enough period of time. Uh, whereas if, if there is any cycle at all, even if you can't time it exactingly, I would say that the rhythm test is still appropriate because it gives you such a wide variety of time frames in terms of what their levels are. So I wouldn't discount the rhythm or rhythm plus test for someone who is cycling very irregularly. But if someone's menopausal, I would move more towards the menopause plus. Uh, some might say the one day. Again, I would lean towards that. And by the way, if you're doing a rhythm test, one thing I would always recommend is have the patient journal. Because sometimes a patient will come to you and say, uh, I have an irregular cycle, but I notice that as part of the cycle, I get migraines, I get you know, certain symptoms. By, by writing in a journal like, oh, it's day 12, and of my collection and I'm starting to have my migraine, we can look at the graph uh, and, and see what is the level of estrogen to progesterone when those symptoms arise. Great, thank you. Um, another person was just asking about the availability of the presentation today. So the presentation and slide deck will be available on our website within a few days of this webinar. Um, another clinical question we had was, 
if someone runs the complete hormones and it's showing that they're not detoxing their estrogens very well, or maybe they have SNPs, which is an add-on to the complete hormones, the single nucleotide polymorphisms to look at their genetic ability to detox. Um, but they have, they have a need for hormones. So the clinician wants to give them hormones, but they're seeing that they're not detoxing very well. Um, what are your thoughts in that situation? I think if, if I could, I would want to try to do everything I could do to upregulate a better pathway of detoxification, a less risk-inducing pathway of detoxification. So I would uh, do a, a complete hormones, or uh, remember, you can do the essential estrogens and just get the uh, estrogen portion of that. And I would work with things like DIM, with nutrition, certainly with the adrenals, uh, to do whatever I could to upregulate detoxification um, and the pathways like to the 2-hydroxy phase 1 metabolite before increasing the levels uh, of hormones. And by the way, the same holds true with the anabolic catabolic balance. You know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about giving progesterone, but I'm seeing a very catabolic balance where the progesterone is just moving to the catabolic side of the scale, I'm going to try to really work with those adrenals first uh, uh, before I'm going to increase progesterone levels in that patient because I might just be setting them up for even more cortisol and more difficulty. So uh, the bottom line, I think, is do whatever you can to first uh, change the situation so that it's detoxifying better uh, and then think about adding more hormones uh, to the picture. Right. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, so what, another question here, what considerations would the clinician consider for the patient with night sweats? Well, you know, that's a great question in that on the phone, uh, when, I, when I have these calls, everyone tends to lean right away to, oh, night sweats equals estrogen deficiency. And then you see perhaps that there's not an estrogen deficiency or you're supplementing with estrogen and it's not making a difference. I think it's important to remember that night sweats, well, especially hot flashes, uh, also too much adrenaline. Um, and so uh, when you're thinking about night sweats and hot flashes, Think also about the adrenals because uh, it could be uh, adrenaline fluctuations that can create high levels of adrenaline can create that. So you want to balance the adrenals and the HPA axis and not just look at the estrogen levels, although that's certainly important. And again, it always, it, it always seems to take us back to balance, doesn't it? That it's not necessarily this one thing. Like we saw with this second case study, she had low thyroid, but she also, you know, had issues around high cortisol, which could be the reason for her low thyroid. That's why you want as much data as you can get, and that's why you want to really look at the balance overall. Yeah, that's a good point. The hormones don't work in isolation. That's right. Um, okay, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Is the urine complete hormones a good way to assess androgen status? Well, you know, as I mentioned, um, as far as DHEA, I would say yes, because with the DHEA, you have that 17 keto steroid total where you can get the face value of the DHEA, but DHEA is similar to progesterone. Remember, we look at a metabolite of progesterone. DHEA is often going to be metabolized, but by having that uh, uh, 17 keto steroid total of DHEA plus the metabolites, I think you get a good picture of DHEA. I think the testosterone is not as clear. Um, uh, the testosterone uh, is, is, is more difficult to track in the urine, uh, in my experience. We do look at the possibility that the testosterone may be uh, making DHT, and there's a 5-alpha reductase equation that we didn't describe that's in the complete hormones to see whether there's a tendency to make DHT from testosterone. But I think that specifically testosterone is, is, is more difficult uh, because some of it may be uh, aromatized into the estrogens, some of it may be making DHT. And I would say, for example, if you have a patient that's showing PCOS type symptoms, um, you know, you probably want to get a different measurement, a salivary or blood measure of testosterone specifically. Um, uh, I think as far as androgens, the testosterone, uh, blood, and certainly um, uh, uh, saliva is a very good way to go. Great. Well, thanks, Dr. Goldman. And in the interest of time, we'll have to end our question and answer period there. 
For additional educational materials, we'd like to encourage you to visit our website and or contact client services. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialists to answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing patient test results. Finally, we'd like to encourage you to register for our upcoming webinars on our website. Next month, we'll have Dr. Ann Shippey presenting on epigenetics, telling your genes how to behave, and several other speakers to follow in the upcoming months, including Dr. Elizabeth Ford on nutritional testing and pain management, and me, Dr. Christine Stubbe. I'm going to be talking about parasitology, and Dr. Michael Chapman will be speaking about methylation. Thanks again, Dr. Goldman, for a great presentation. Thank you. Everybody, My great pleasure. Day.